does it mean to regenerate? The reemergence of the concept of regeneration in our culture is a hot topic. From producers to products, legislation to certifications, celebrities to students, there's no shortage of passionate perspectives. Welcome to Regen Circle. I'm Paige Fay, and on this show, we're here to explore the reemergence of regenerative concepts and practices and their impact on ecosystems and culture. If you like what you hear, take a moment to subscribe, rate, and review the show. Welcome to the circle. Welcome everyone. Today on the show, I have Georgiana Johnson. She is an incredible new friend that I've had the pleasure to just begin to get to know. And she is an incredible holistic chef, a postpartum doula, and does other amazing work in the world, including is a practicing kundalini yogi. So Georgiana, I'm so happy to have you on the show today. So I love to start with all of my guests about where are you grounding into place? So where are you in the world and what's significant about where you are? Well, I am actually in Bozeman, Montana, in the United States. I moved here a year and a half ago. So grounding is definitely a key word, because even though I've been here for a year and a half, moving to a new city takes a long time to settle in. And I, I'm from London originally. So I moved, I moved here after 15 years of living in California. And before that, I lived in uh, Bali, Thailand, India and England. So I've been around. I've never lived in a place like this though with snow. What drew you to Bozeman, Montana after all of those tropical places in California? What brought you there? Probably that. <laughs> I mean, um, I grew up in the four seasons. We have an eight-month winter in London, and the winter here is eight months long. But in England, the the winter is rain, gray skies, misery, and complaining because of the weather. People talk about the weather because it's a little island, so the weather changes all the time. Um, it can be hot one day and then freezing cold the next. But um, I think that's why I went to hot places after that. So I, it was really nice for me to live by the sea in California for 15 years and be able to walk barefoot to the edge of the sea in the morning, in the evening, when I got home from work, anytime I liked. Because, you know, in, in England, it's not a beach, beachy kind of place. <laughs> um, and then I think after a while, I just got tired of the ever-repeating known of the summer. Mm. And so I came to Montana in the pandemic for work. I'd never been here before. I had never even heard of Bozeman. And... I was, you know, I, I was actually really pleasantly surprised when I landed. I was like, oh, the air is so fresh. Mm. It tastes like a, it tastes like a crunchy salad and you just feel so oxygenated all the time. And just simple luxuries, like being able to drink tap water from a well and have so much space around you, including a very large garden. Mm. And I can have birds and you know, you can have pets. I just thought, wow, this would be a really nice place to raise kids mm. as opposed to big cities, which I think I grew up in a big city and I always felt so lucky to grow up in London because I had so much freedom as a young girl. I, I had a bus pass from the age of 13 or whatever, and I would just get on a bus and go wherever I wanted. And it was so, there was so much to do and it was so stimulating and um, I, I I felt palpably really lucky. And then moving to Los Angeles, I started to feel like I was living in purgatory a little bit because it's like the traffic is just relentless mm -hmm. and the schools look like jails. Yeah. Unless you send them to a nice school in Topanga, but sure, there's not much choice. And um, I was just like, oh God. And, you know, you see kids kind of, stuck to their ipads now yeah. with with these earphones earphones in totally disconnected from the world including their family members they'll be sitting there at the dinner table at the end of the day just like playing a game and i was like this this would drive me mad if i if i had this in my family home and if i raised kids like this it would drive me mad so it's like i need to move somewhere else even the sea even though it's so nice to be near the sea and you can to go skateboarding and surfing as a kid it's just not that safe 
So that, that's one of the big reasons why I moved here. And it's it's funny because when I came, it kind of imprinted on me because I, I went every time I would leave, I was just like, God, the it, I felt like I was being ripped from heaven because it's mm. nature is so beautiful. Yeah. Unlike anywhere I've ever seen before. And um when I go hiking, I get this feeling of when I when I die, I want to become part of these mountains, which I've never felt before in any of the other places I've lived. So I definitely think it's like a a spiritual connection. Yeah. But everyone who lives here loves it. I have a few friends who have lived there and it's um it's a magical place. And you know, I just recently I grew up outside of Los Angeles and my partner and I had moved back. I hadn't lived there in 13 years and we moved back for the last year and and then I got pregnant. And I just had this instant moment when I was like, I, I can't raise my child here. I, I just can't, um, I can't do it. Um, even though Topanga and other parts are beautiful and I love all the creativity that comes out of a city like Los Angeles and just all that you have access to. There was a point in my nervous system that just said, this isn't, this isn't worth it. You need space. You need a garden. You need that community. You need to, to be able to roam in the mountains. And so I understand. Yeah, I understand that that feeling um since being there like how has it changed your practice and your work as a postpartum doula and and your work as a chef like what has shifted for you oh a lot I mean I had a very busy practice in Los Angeles it's it, I think the population there is over three million and the population in Bozeman is I think 50,000 or fifth between 50 and 70,000 I think so and also I was a doula in the pandemic. Mm. So I had to, I had to take a little pause in my practice just to take a break for myself just for my mental health after mm. having been so involved in healthcare during that very unsafe time because I was hearing the most wild birth stories and hospital policy was just so disappointing. And so after that, I was just like, I just don't know if I can continue to do work in this field in good faith because mm -hmm. I feel like I'm part of the problem. I don't feel like I can, I can help elevate how uh, restrictive and how kind of unethical it's become yeah. just through, you know, gradually. And then it was totally accelerated during the pandemic where you know, there was so much fear. So I took a break from that. And I actually was offered a job to work at a nonprofit as a culinary director. Um, funnily enough, you know, it's like, we, we have created this retreat center in um, slightly a, a little outside Bozeman, where the special operations community can come and receive holistic support, as they transition out of, um, you know, being in active duty. Wow, which is so interesting because if you think about it, that's what a postpartum doula does, mm. but just in a more female, feminine way. Is we're we're helping you um, reintegrate back into the world after you've pretty much had a not not in a negative way, but you know, some women do feel like it was a near death experience, mm -hmm. and you know, it was probably one of the most rewarding but most challenging things that you could ever go through and you know there's such a mixture of feeling uh, uh, emotions when you settle down such as like I'm so proud of myself real proud you know I always that's what I look for when I look at a photo of a new mom is does she look proud mm. because she should feel proud I think yeah however she did it and then um you know there's a very large hormone drop so um, a lot of mixed feelings can come up and the best thing to do is to just um, be very calm and patient with yourself and surround yourself with people who are really calm and patient. I say to the dads, I'm like, this is going to be your PhD in taking nothing personally mm. because this is a temporary time. And you will never have seen her go through this before, this hormonal cycle. So be patient and take nothing personally. Mm. So it's it's been a nice shift. I mean, I, I do miss the babies, though. Yeah. Because they're so sweet. 
(laughs) I, I can't wait for that part. Um, and it's, it's such intensive work and it's interesting because even in selecting and hiring my postpartum doula for that period, after I give birth, um, she's a dear friend and she's also, also a chef and also Mm -hmm. works really closely with the land. And she's, you know, a gardener and, you know, stewarded and, and creates a lot of her nutrition from the garden or local sources. And and, and she's incredibly hands-on with that. And I was sort of thinking about it. And I was thinking about how we treat nutrition for the postpartum period or how we should, you know, how ancient traditions have, and then how people like yourselves treat it. And I was getting the sense that it's not just about calories, which obviously become important if you're breastfeeding and, and there's there's a high nutritional demand, but it really, there was a high sensitivity to the source and where things came from. And I'm wondering, I got that sense when we got to chat before the podcast, and I'm wondering if you could just dive into that and what is that connection to source when you're nourishing a new mother? It's so simple. It's prana. Mm. So the the more prana you have in something, the more nourishing it's going to be for your entire being. So prana basically translates to life force energy. And if you're cooking something, you know, if you're nourishing your garden yourself and you're you're tending to it every day and you're watering it every day, you have that connection to the earth and to the ingredients that you're using. When you harvest them yourself, they are completely intact. And when you are, you know, you're harvesting them when they're ripe, un, un, unlike, you know, going into Whole Foods, especially Whole Foods in Bozeman, because <laughs> there's only one. And it's so hard to get here that they, you know, they pick vegetables before they're ripe and they put them in a van or a truck and it takes days for them to get here and so that's why they pick them before they're ripe they they you know they are supposed to ripen a little more in the during the transport of getting them to one place to another which you know america is a very large land mass so i i would say generally that's true with every single supermarket bought produce that is not local yeah so you know the nutritional content made the bottom line is just going to be so much more full when the person who's making your food has loved every second of it and given it their full attention as they were preparing it. It's just prana. And the same is true for leftovers and restaurant food. Like, you know, I've worked in so many different um, sections of the food industry And to be perfectly honest, a lot of restaurant food is just reheated. It was prepped the day before or that morning, and then they've reheated it. Like, say, if you buy a pasta, if you order pasta, they'll cook the pasta fresh, but the the sauce will be reheated. Mm -hmm. So what happens when you reheat food? Well, it's already lost the prana. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to make something and serve it then and there if you freeze it or or it basically an ayurveda if you let it lose its original heat then Mm. it's lost its prana i had a moment when you were describing you know picking vegetables before they're ripe which which a lot of people know and and that's the way to get it to the store and it's why we have avocados that are totally green and not ripe at all and then and then some that are incredibly ripe we get this variation and i was thinking about something that I had learned in a course that I was taking um, about, you know, holistic um, birthing and about, you know, the umbilical cord and the delayed cord clamping, which a lot of people know about. And we never used to think about that. You know, it's just like, oh, the baby's out. And so we're going to cut the cord. And I had this moment when you were talking when it's like, well, when we pick vegetables before they're ripe, it's sort of like, we're just immediately cutting the cord. You know, we're not letting all of the nutrition, we're not letting it come to its full blossoming state. Um, And so it it was just reminding me like that deep connection in the work that you do between nutrition and the way that 
the land is tended for and then and then nurturing a, a mother and a child i mean we live in a fast food fast paced impatient world where subtlety is kind of labeled as hocus pocus and it's a shame but we make it through it does it doesn't we don't die from from it but i think there is a, a sense of peace that is lost along the way somehow and what have you seen that is lost like in that period of time the mother and a child like if they're not tended to in the way and if there isn't that subtlety and that deep care what effects have you seen physically psychologically why well, I, I would say generally if you look at the mental health of the mass population i wouldn't say it's good i wouldn't say I would say it's rare to come across someone who is who feels really whole and positive more than 80% of the time. I think it I think I I I mean I've lived in the United States now for 16 years so I can only speak from my experience from the last 16 years of living here. But um I would say that this industrialized lifestyle that we're living is not it doesn't really suit our species it doesn't seem to be suiting us and i think that we spend way too much time working and you know we're human beings not human doings and the fact that we have we've become so disconnected from our own bodies that we don't see the value in walking barefoot on the earth i just find that so strange because it's it feels so good and actually what's so funny I was thinking about this the other day my cousin in LA her name's JJ she's 15 now she has a diagnosis she's pretty she's got a, a pretty severe special needs diagnosis and I did her IEP which is an individualized education education plan basically you do it every year where the school system checks in on her sees how she's doing and and possibly moves her to a different school with a better a better program that can meet her needs so it's a very important thing for us to do well and I did her first IEP and I kept seeing this question popping up over and over again which was does the child like to take off her shoes when she's inside and I was like how is that a sign of of being special needs She's trying to be more connected to the floor. I just thought it was so odd. And what, what is so interesting about her is that she is highly sensitive. She doesn't have a, um, you know, a well-developed prefrontal cortex in the same way as someone with a diagnosis, that someone without a diagnosis would have. She's more um, uh, intuitive. And so I just thought it was so interesting that we would we would look at that in a child and maybe see that there was something wrong with them. I've been thinking about that a lot in our in the sort of obstetrics model of of care um, and the sort of um, laser focus on pathology. You know, people are they're, they're looking for pathology and and they're they've sort of defined what is normal and then anything outside of that is an issue. Um, and I, th I was thinking about it cause I was like, well, how is it, how does a natural system handle things outside of the norm? Right. I think that's what we call evolution, right? There's like this adaptation and this adjustment. And I was thinking about our inability to adapt and adjust and sort of the, the efficiency and the conveyor belt that we've put our food system and we've put our healthcare system on and how it's, how it's sort of decreased our ability to adapt as a as a species as individuals as communities yeah i think it really has um, affected our ability to think quickly as well be spontaneous and make good decisions on a whim because we're not we're not ever presented with an with a situation where we have to because i think we've labeled that as like being in danger that's just living 
So when we were chatting before this podcast, we we got pretty fired up and we got pretty deep into like industrial food systems and healthcare systems. And I want to dive into that topic because I think it's a really important one. And there's a lot of there's a lot of parallels. And I guess to kick it off, I'd love to understand from your perspective as someone who nourishes people holistically, like what are the challenges that you see that we're up against with, with our healthcare and our food system? A lot. <laughs> you can start with like the top few. <laughs> oh my God. When I meet a client and they want me to cook for them, the first thing I need to assess is, are they already healthy or do they need a complete lifestyle makeover? Because if they're already healthy, the chances are I just need to plump up what they already know. But if they need a total lifestyle makeover, then they need to get an education. And they under, they need to understand that some ingredients that are in their kitchen that have been approved by the FDA are carcinogenic. They just... And they are inflammatory foods and they're pretty much in everything. And they are also very inexpensive. And so it's, you know, it's like the perfect storm. Create cheap, unhealthy foods, make your citizens really, really sick, then give them overpriced, very inadequate healthcare, where the doctors haven't even studied nutrition. And they'll think that you're crazy if you talk about turmeric when they say that you have inflammation. <laughs> when Hippocrates, who's the founder of modern medicine, who everyone sweat takes that oath when they become a doctor, do no harm, first do no harm. He said, uh, let, me, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. And they're not taught nutrition. Canola oil is so toxic. It tastes disgusting. If you really smell it, it smells like glue. I mean, it doesn't really have a flavor, but I can I can feel it when it's in food. And high fructose corn syrup is in every sweet, you know, commercial chocolate that children like to eat. It's the first ingredient in baby formula. It's a neurotoxin. So it, it makes you think, why are they doing this? <laughs> if they know that. It's not nice to do that to a baby. And it's not nice to do that to a new mom, new parents or a family that can't afford to buy European formula and ship it to the US, which is going to be so many families. Yeah. So it I always come down to why. And I, I do think it's because when we're not dumbed down as a species and when we're taken care of really, really beautifully from the beginning we're born, we're, we, we have the potential to be really, really powerful. Mm. But if you dumb us down, then, you, then you'll never know. Mm. And we become easier to control as, as a group. Mm. I think there's also this component of that they've created this money loop system for themselves you know like I think people obviously knew Monsanto as the demon you know GMO seed company is how they were sort of labeled and Bayer one of the largest ph pharmaceutical companies bought them out and I think that there's this very insidious cycle that's going on where the only thing that matters is profit and that's really scary. I think that's the thing that scares me the most about our world. High fructose corn syrup is terrifying, but this sort of stint towards profit above all else. And I wonder where human enjoyment went in any of that. Well, I do sometimes wonder if there are different species on our planet that look human, but are not human. <laughs> you know, and it's like, how could you spend your life doing that? to other people and and you know uh how, how how do you enjoy spending all this money that you have it's so odd and when when you're coaching someone and when you're you know cooking for someone and you're sort of evaluating how they eat and how they live their life what are some of the top things that maybe 
keep them from feeling good or keeping them from being vibrant and clear? Like, are there, are there top things that when you see that you're like, oh, that has to go first. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of the time it's not food. I see food as like something that we all need every day no matter what you are, even if you're not human, we all need something because our bodies are made of organic matter and we need something to help us keep going. But I do think that if you hate your job, you know, if you're in a bad partnership, um, you're keeping a secret that's eating you up on the inside or you're out of integrity in any way of your life. I think it really is like being out of integrity. It, it makes you drain so much energy. Um, and I, I I can sometimes see that. It's not my job to like directly instruct them on what I think they should do because it really is just a perception. But if you start making positive changes in your life and you start feeling really, really good on the inside out, from the inside out, then you do start to feel those corners of your life where there's things you need to clean up mm. you do start feeling them more more um they're more they become more obvious mm. so the individual is more likely to take care of it themselves mm. it's almost like if you clean it up around the edges then the things that aren't clean become more blatant they become more black more glaring white. black and white there's more yeah. contrast but the problem is, is that if you're, if, if you're in, especially, let's say you're in a toxic marriage and you have kids or whatever, um, you could both end up just brushing it under the carpet and both being compliant in it. And a lot of people do that. Yeah. Is that, that their ability to withhold that kind of discomfort is really quite impressive. <laughs> Our coping mechanisms are pretty incredible, you know, depending on oh, yeah. the trauma and what the person's been through, like the things that they're able to do to cope are, it is miraculous in a lot of ways. I mean, fear is a powerful thing. It will stop you from following your heart. Mm -hmm. It will stop you from doing that very thing that when you're on your deathbed, you'll be like, God, I wish I, I would have done that in my life. It's just fear. I want to speak a little bit to since being pregnant, I felt, uh, you know, a fair bit. There's just a lot more attention towards pregnant mothers, right? It, you could call it attention. You could call it projection. You can call it whatever you want, but there's suddenly like a lot of attention and a lot of opinions. And I'm curious about where you think that comes from having spent a lot of time around it. Well, pregnant women glow. They are just magnetic. They're oozing with life. They're, you know, they're the promise of a future. And they're doing something so magical and mysterious. And I think also, um, I think people like to pass down wisdom and, and feel important or tell, tell, you know, try and hand something down, thinking that they're the only one who's done it. And I think, you know, I, I say to my clients, like, don't, don't tell anyone your, your due date. Tell, tell people it's at least a month or two late, later than it really is. <laughs> because at the end of your pregnancy, if you tell people your due date, every day you'll get a message. Is the baby here? Is the baby here? And it's so stressful because you're also wondering the same thing. And um, I think it, I think it's excitement, you know, people are very excited and um, especially if they know someone really well, because, you know, they're going to get to watch this kid grow up, yeah. which is really magical. But I do think that I wish more women, more pregnant women and more women that work in this field could have advertisement banners on the side of the road just being like don't ask her if the baby's come yet it's really unhelpful yeah. um I've definitely had that own own policy within my own own family I've given it a bit of wiggle room I haven't done a full month but I have given it a bit of wiggle room for the same reason and you know I thought it was really fascinating to learn that labor is actually initiated 
by a hormone secreted by the child or by the fetus, if you want to call it. Like that's, they're the initiators of the whole physiological process of birth. Um, and so I was always sort of just like, well, if they're initiating it, then I should just sit back and relax. I mean, easy enough. I'm not 40 weeks and about to pop, but um, that's how I felt about it. Yeah. I mean, um, that's a really amazing thing because it, it, it's, it's giving credit where credit is due to the baby. I think a lot of people think that babies are just little worms that aren't conscious and they won't remember anything. But if you think about it, the baby time is relative. So the babies lived their whole life as an aquatic creature mm. inside this warm, loving place of unconditional love and food being supplied, you know, as a, as a never ending supply. Mm -hmm. And there's no hard edges, there's no coldness. And the, the last thing to develop is their lungs. Mm. So it makes sense because the first thing, you know, one of the first things they're going to do is take their first breath. And I, in the same way that I think it's um, really brave to believe in a higher power, I think we need to trust these little things a little more. Mm. That also came up, the trust piece, in, in a film that you had me watch before this interview, The Milky Way, which is a beautiful documentary about breastfeeding and, and how it happens all over the world. And um, it, it really highlights that we've lost trust in mothers in that early phase. And in a lot of ways, these formula companies are pushing it out of the gate. There's sort of this desire for mothers to fail. And I'm just, I want to talk about that more because it really, it really broke my heart to see how, how much money and energy was poured into wanting mothers to fail. And so babies could be fed this formula that it should be illegal that they can market it as better for you when the first ingredient is high fructose corn syrup. I mean, of course, I'm glad that something exists and there's clearly European formulas and others that are better, better for mothers that can't produce milk or can't get milk from a wet nurse or a friend. But that just, it really bothered me on a deep level. How powerful we are. Mm. You know, to the same degree that that bothers you, it, the same degree that it's true that that's how powerful we are mm. as a species and how you really hurt us is by separating mother and child and it's it, you know it's that's becoming normal look at look at look at maternity leave in the u.s there's no obligation for any company to give you paid time off it's, and how do you, how can you claim to care about people? You know, it's like, that really does make you think about the, the proportion of time you spend working. And if you died, what would happen? They would just replace you. But everyone in your life, your friends and your partner would never be the same again but we're not spending enough time with these people right. because we're um, trying to keep the wheels rolling of our lives. Mm -hmm. And we, we say, Oh yeah, babies won't remember it. Babies won't remember it. And I'm like, God, it's so funny when you meet adults these days, it, it's like you're, you're meeting the undigest, their undigested childhood. You can see kind of what happened to them by how they handle stress, by how much emotional bandwidth they have, how they treat others when they're under stress. But it can go either way, depending on the kid. Like if you grow up in a in a family where there was a lot of struggle, you mm -hmm. inside your heart could choose to not go down that same route. But for other people, it's all they know. Yeah, That's the only way they know how to be makes me wonder in your time working with so many babies and now also working with people who have been in the service and risked their lives and likely gone through a great deal of trauma, how do you see nourishment, both 
at the sort of infant stage and even at the adult phase change our epigenetics, alter our whole way of seeing and being in the world? Well, I would also, you know, epigenetics, interestingly enough, is affected by your environment. So six weeks, it takes six weeks for your genetic expression to be affected by your environment, which really makes you think seriously about taking your world as a whole more seriously. Better friends, better environment is one of the reasons why I moved here to Bozeman, because I wanted to breathe fresh air 24 seven. I wanted to be around better water. So I guess I've kind of been in my own little epigenetic shift. I would say, um, me personally, I was becoming drained. My nervous system was getting very drained by the city. But for someone else, it's stimulated. Their nervous system is stimulated by the excitement. Mm. But I'd had enough of that personally. So, yeah, I mean, six weeks, that's all. But with food, it goes through generations. There's a great book called um, Nutrition and Degeneration, I think. It's by Weston A. Price, and it's how you can look at someone's face and their jaw and their teeth, and you can see how they were malnourished as, mm. a, as a child. So it is affecting our evolution. And I think looking at all our phones is also affecting our brains and how our brains are being shaped. I have no idea where we're going, but I don't think as a species that the, ev the evidence is positive. I think, um, you know, a lot of people are on medication for depression, anxiety, and those those medications are so sophisticated. You know, unlike recreational drugs, they're kind of made of complex molecular uh, chemical structures that are kind of designed to, to for you to never get off them. Mm -hmm. So, it's another good business model. <laughs> All these business models in service of degeneration. I, you know, I, I haven't, I've thought about the degeneration of our ecologies a lot in our environments and the effect that our industrial society is having on the rest of the living world. I haven't so much thought about the degeneration of our species. And mm. of course it's, it's happening, but I, I think it's a really interesting piece that you bring up and if that is indeed what's happening, then how is our capacity to evolve and, and shift these degenerative practices? How is that also diminishing? Adults, adults have autonomy because we're emancipated. We can do whatever the hell we want, and we do. I say adults do what kids aren't allowed to do, and we do it badly. So just have a look at the kids because they are under the umbrella of our choices. One in 10 children have a diagnosis in the United States now. Some of the kids that I feed have worse uh, medical conditions than their parents. So these foods that we've put out into the world because we can't be bothered to cook, we'd rather watch TV or whatever, or not be challenged to take care of ourselves properly. They are hurting children. And it just makes you wonder, um, it's hard not to get negative, you know, because it's not helpful. Yeah. Just getting do doom and gloomy about it. I'm just like, everyone just needs to learn how to cook. Kids love cooking. And they love gardening. <laughs> You know, it's just, just educate them a little bit. Get them a little garden in your house. Get a little light over it if you don't have if you don't have space outside your home. Get them to put a little seed in the soil and water it. Give it give it to them, their responsibility like a pet, and then allow them to watch it grow. It's like magic. They love it. 
it's the adults that don't like doing it. Children, mm -hmm. adults complain more in my cooking lessons than children do. <laughs> children, children are like, can I help? Can I help? Can I help? And you just tell them what to do. You know, here's a quarter cup. Just put one quarter of a cup in the muffin. You make the mix. You can show them how to make the mix. They pour the thing in the muffin holder. It won't be the perfect muffin you've ever seen. It'll taste exactly the same as if you'd made it. And they'll be so proud of it. That's how you get, that's how you improve the future is teaching kids to cook. And you can teach them maths at the same time. <laughs> Counting numbers, colors, smells, fruits, vegetables, different types of meats. Yeah. It's like an education, a one-stop shop. Mm. That's exactly where I wanted to take this conversation because there is so much negativity that we could focus on in the world. And the more educated you become, I think the more clear that becomes. Um, in your mind, teaching children how to grow seeds, teaching children how to cook and work with food. If you were to like extrapolate that out onto a much bigger system, what would that look like in terms of a global solution for shifting the way that that we're nourished and and therefore sort of shifting everything else? Having a farm at the schools mm. and a and a vegetable patch. But you know, it's like teachers are so overworked and they're so underpaid. They've got one teacher in a room of 20 children. Are you kidding me? No. <laughs> like that is hard work. And to expect them to do more than they're already doing and paying them like 50 grand a year to basically be a free babysitter to 20 kids. We need to have a little more respect for the teachers and we need to resource them. And we need to change the curriculums in the school, which of course are all funded, but you know, curriculums at school and universities are in are in control by all the same people who run all these corporate entities that we've been talking about. Right. And so if you were to see it on a local level, like even in your own community in Bozeman, like how do we how do we kind of get an out from under the thumb of of all of this? degenerative influence and and build more resilient community systems i think you well this is what i would do having been in a pandemic for two years and having seen the underbelly of la usd school system through my cousin and as a woman that wants to be a mom like i don't have time to wait for someone to tell me what to do i would personally headhunt a really great teacher that I really liked, maybe two or three with different skill sets. And I would recruit however many families, maybe 10 for each group at a max. And I would get this these tutors to teach these kids an interesting curriculum that we could choose ourselves. There's many homeschool curriculums that you can choose from. And I would put kids in, in classes with different age groups and I would get them to be using their hands more rather than sitting at a desk for eight hours and then given ADHD medication because they can't concentrate when they're the most vital they've ever been and they're being told by an adult to sit at a desk for eight hours and that there's something wrong with them if they can't concentrate <laughs> so that's what I personally would do one of my questions when I was dating was, I would ask a guy, what do you think of homework? Like, would you want your kids doing homework when they come home? Because homework is not allowed in my house. Like, they've just been at school for eight hours. If you didn't teach them what they needed to know, you should have. They're not, they're not doing homework. They're going skiing. They're going to play with the dog. They're going to go swimming in the lake. They're going to go feed the ducks you know they're gonna have some quality time with their parents we haven't seen them for eight hours um so I think the beginning of the day or the end of the day depending on the, the you know because some people are morning people and some people are not so I think you you get them doing something academic for half the day I mean like four hours 
and then something physical for for about four hours and not like basketball or you know not a competitive sports something physical like gardening or just playing you know just leaving them in a room with a bunch of art and letting them create and daydream or letting or giving them some props and letting them make a play or something mm. that they, they, they can perform at the end instead of indoctrinating them with these really um soulless curriculums it's such a breath of fresh air no it's it's um it's funny because i had i talked to and i'm obviously you know a bit a ways away from this but i talked to one other mother who had done something similar and just sort of found her own teachers and recruited other parents and and created the environment that she wanted you know i've attempted to do that with my own pregnancy and 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 finding the teen that i want with me and it's a lot more work, but it's worth it so far. It's super rewarding, you know? And I think, you know, I had my mother with me at my midwife appointment the other day and she was like, wow, your generation is just so much more empowered to make different choices, you know, versus being sort of corralled into these options. And I think that's been the biggest thing for me with people, whether it's their food or how they live their lives is like, if you think that you don't have options, take a step back and look at it differently because that's not, that's not the reality that that is a simulation that's that's being created um, to try to control because there are so many incredible options available in to change the way that we live and to be in greater integrity and, and greater health. Yeah, I would say the, the phrase care provider is very ironic. Because a lot of the a lot and i'm not generalizing I, I try not to generalize as much as i can but i do see themes i really do when women that give birth in hospitals and densely populated cities they come out really really traumatized i think because their doctors are traumatized mm -hmm. i think because labor and delivery nurses are traumatized because they're so desensitized from what they're seeing day in and day out because the system is corrupt I mean, I don't know if this is appropriate for a for a podcast to go on the internet, but I received a normal grooming session from a woman. You know, I was going on holiday, so I went and got my bikini wax, and I was chatting to her, and I, and I was like, "So, what else do you what what else are you up to in life?" And she was like, "Oh, I'm a labor and delivery nurse." And she was like, "What do you do?" I was like, "I'm a doula." And so, some some people would say we are enemies. It depends on what hospital you go to. It felt a little tense, and then I could feel this hate towards my body radiating off her. Mm -hmm. And it, was, it wasn't because of, I was a doula or because I was a woman. It was just something that is so embodied in her that it's outside of her awareness because mm -hmm. she works in that system. And I was so, I was like, oh, no wonder it's like this. Like, I'm not even giving birth. And she, and I can feel it. I was like, oh God. <laughs> and it, it helps you have compassion for them. What advice would you have for me, someone who's going to be a mother soon in terms of the most important things that you can do to, in those early days and weeks and months to set my child up, your child up for a different kind of life, a more integrated, a more nourished life? Well, I would say start as you mean to go on, which is relish every moment and listen to your instincts. They will be activated. And however your birth goes, no one has control over, you know, Mother Nature is bigger than us. And you will be guided through a river that only you can go down. And that's a good thing. And I would say to give your partner the heads up that um, not to take anything personally. <laughs> and to be patient. Mm -hmm. And to understand and, and remind him whilst, you're, you know, if you go to a dark place or if you f don't feel like yourself, it's because you, you know, there is a sort of death that goes along with it in the same way as, getting married is sort of like a funeral for your single girl, your best single girl life. <laughs> this is like 
another layer on that as mm. you're leaving a chapter of your life behind and it's okay to grieve it's okay to have days where you're like oh god were you second guessing yourself and know that it's that, that it's temporary and mm. may just relish every moment with your baby because mm. growing every day and babies they they start crawling away from you very very soon and exploring the world mm. <laughs> so make the most of it when they're right on your chest mm. and don't be afraid to tell anyone to fuck off and shut up when you're in labor <laughs> if someone's annoying you tell them to fuck off <laughs> i mean it <laughs> don't be afraid don't be afraid to be direct and honest mm. and you can tell you can tell, you know, midwives, are they're used to that. They see it all the time. And it's actually a good thing yeah. when you see a woman being like, that light is too bright, turn it down or get the dog out of the room. The dog's energy is annoying me. Like you will get so sensitive to any shift. Don't be afraid to have boundaries with people when they come and visit you because um, it can be quite draining. Definitely leave one of those signs on your door being like if you're going to come into this house please help do the dishes or don't stay longer than 20 minutes mm -hmm. you know but that is helpful because people even women with babies with children they forgot yeah what the early mm -hmm. postpartum time is like and the kind of delicate energy that they need around them and eat lots of ghee that's a magical superfood and and you'll you'll be sort of in a hibernation stage so Try and keep your surroundings a little dark. So when you're in labor, try and keep your room as dark as you can and just make everything really cozy and keep yourself really warm and drink lots of water. And my last question for you is taking that out from one woman and one birth to a whole humanity, what would a regenerative culture look like to you what would your definition of that be what would that mean to you oh my god it's so easy just revolve everything you do around children their emotional physical and spiritual safety every decision you make make it on behalf of the innocent people of in the world it would change the world so fast and it would make everything so much more fun and imaginative. And I think adults need that. <laughs> we do. We do. Thank you so much for that. And that's such a potent message, especially right now at all times and right now in the world. Thank you, Georgiana, for, for coming on with me today. I'm, I'm so grateful to have received the wisdom and um, I hope I get to receive your food at some point in the not too distant future. <laughs> so great. You've been so curious in this chapter of your life. It may seem like it's, it's more hard work, <laughs> but it, it's in the long run, you know, they say there's no shortcuts in life. The long, the long route is the shortcut. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. If you liked what you heard, take a moment to subscribe, rate, and review the show. And if you want to learn more about how to get involved with The Circle, visit us at our website or on social media. We're always looking for like-minded people to connect.